It's uh, awesome. Anyway, my message is kind of shaped around encounter night coming up in 11 days, and I'm really excited for it. I know every time I have the opportunity to, to spruik encounter night that I'm really encouraging people to come along, and I think it's really important that people do come along, because one of the, the key functions or one of the key beliefs that we hold as a church is the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what the encounter night is all about, working or allowing the Holy Spirit, allowing time for us as believers to have the Holy Spirit meet with us, that we would encounter the Holy Spirit and that we would be changed. And I don't know, yeah, the title of my message this morning, Holy Spirit Friend. I'm going to start the message this morning in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. A lot of people know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It's like the cheat verse when you're in Bible school or when you're in kids' church across there when they're like, what Bible verse do you know? John 3, 16. But Matthew 3, 16, I believe, is just as important, just as life-changing, just as freeing as John 3, 16. And when Jesus was baptized, this is a baptism of water, immediately he went up from the water and and behold, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the Spirit of God, that is the Holy Spirit, descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. I think that man's interpretation of the Holy Spirit in recent years hasn't actually done him justice. And I think if we're honest, sometimes we make the conversation really awkward and super intense to the point now where I think by default we choose to exclude the Holy Spirit in our conversations, in our, in our lives, so that we don't come across as weird. Like we don't want to be the, the, the super weird Christian believer always talking about the Holy Spirit and, and not articulating who the Holy Spirit is. And we look at the illustration of the Holy Spirit coming to Jesus like a dove. And similar to what Shane Willard was talking about when he was here, when when people read bits of Scripture out of context without understanding, they can reach an assumption or a conclusion that isn't necessarily correct. You see, we have this, this image of a white dove descending from heaven to Jesus as a spirit. But it's just that. It's just an illustration. It is a reflection of the nature and who the Holy Spirit is. You know, I work full time. I'm also studying at the moment, and I also volunteer at church. And some weeks, like this week, you feel like you're hit by a bus. It's just one thing after another. It's like, oh my goodness, what's next? What's next? And then it's event after event after event, work, 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 study, 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 church, church, church. But it's just an illustration. When I say I'm hit by a bus, I'm not actually hit by a bus. It's how I convey a message, it's, it's how I convey what circumstance or experience that I'm feeling at the moment. It, it's an illustration when a dove descends onto Jesus. It's not an accurate reflection of who the Holy Spirit is. Is that cool? Does that give you a bit of context where we're going to head this morning? Let's pray. God, I thank you for the moments that we're about to share together. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak to each and every one of us, that this morning you would allow us to have a better understanding of who you are, of your nature, and of the friendship that you desire for each and every one of us to experience. God, and we thank you that the NRL season is back, and we are praying that the Brisbane Broncos will be led from the wilderness this year towards a premiership. In your mighty name, amen. I have an amazing father-in-law, and we get along so well, but he is a a manly Sea Eagles supporter, and uh, I pray for him all the time. And I'm quick to remind him of how dodgy the Manly Seagulls are. And I kind of sent him a message too early on Thursday night and the Broncos got beaten. But anyway, I'm still adamant that they, this is their year. I've got to believe with faith. <laughs> my best friend is actually my uncle James. Now I'll give you some understanding about my uncle James. My grandmother and my mother were pregnant at the same time back in 1991 into 1992. We were 10 weeks apart. James was born in January 1992, and I was born in April 1992. And if you want to talk about weird family dynamics, that is a perfect example. Mom and grandma pregnant at the same time. And uh, James, we're kind of like brothers as much as we are best friends. We grew up together. We broke things together. We almost killed each other 
chopping up a, a neighbor's electric gate. We've traveled together. We've holidayed together. We've been mugged together. We've been in the back of a police car together, not because we did anything wrong, but because we were mugged and we were scared little children. And uh, we've done a lot of life together. We have a great relationship, a great friendship, a great partnership. And uh, I know James inside and out, and James knows me inside and out. I know what annoys James, and James knows what annoys me. I know what James loves to do. Let's watch basketball. James knows what I love to do. Let's watch basketball. And we just get along. We could talk for hours about anything. And I think that's the same type of relationship, the same type of friendship that God desires us to have with the Holy Spirit. And you see, when we shift our interpretation of the Holy Spirit from being this mystical dove to an actual person, our relationship with Him totally changes. And we have this incredible opportunity to experience friendship with Holy Spirit, the person. We have the opportunity to experience the better together life, the better together relationship that we were all meant to have. You look at the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts and you can see that he was key in the early church in the post-ascension of Jesus. Jesus has died for the sins of the world. He's risen three days later and, and proven to his disciples that he is the Son of God. It's like, look, I'm back from the dead, here I am. And then he ascends to heaven to the right hand of God. And I think it's amazing. I, I think Christianity cannot exist without the Holy Spirit because churches would actually just become another social gathering without the power, without the person of the Holy Spirit. We would just be getting together. It would be a religious event without the power, without the person of the Holy Spirit. And we see in the book of Acts, right through the book, that there is this realization by early believers that we are actually better together with the Holy Spirit in partnership with the Holy Spirit than we are without it. Praise God for the rain that we can hear through the acoustic treated roof. That's awesome. <laughs> Just as we are, as a modern church, determined to represent Jesus in a relevant way to our community, so too I think that we should be determined to represent the Holy Spirit in the same way. And you know, we can only do that by, by knowing Him. And we can only do that if we allow the nature and the person and the quality of the Holy Spirit into our lives. Two people that understood the Holy Spirit incredibly well as a person were, were Luke and Paul in the Bible. Dr. Luke writes the book of Acts and recounts the encounters and the experiences with the Holy Spirit that the early church had. Then we see the Apostle Paul, that he experiences this amazing moment of salvation and then commits his life to helping believers, communities of believers across the world. And, and both men had this incredible friendship with the Holy Spirit that empowered their lives and empowered their ministry. And I believe that's God's desire that we would have the same type of friendship as Dr. Luke and the Apostle Paul. In his final letter to the church in Corinth, Paul has written two letters. He concludes it, this final letter after giving them instruction on how to conduct themselves, how to experience the grace of Jesus. His conclusion is this, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Well, in that verse, Paul has identified the three distinctions between the Godhead, the grace of Jesus Christ the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit. The Greek word for communion is actually a word uh, called koinonia. I don't know if I've pronounced that right, but it'll do for this morning. This morning, Koinonia means fellowship or partnership or to be intimate. And all three translations of that word koinonia are significant to us if we are to have a friendship with Jesus. Because we can't have a friendship or do life together with the Holy Spirit without fellowship. We can't have a friendship or do life together with the Holy Spirit without partnership. And we can't do life together, have a friendship with the Holy Spirit without moments of intimacy. 
Now, when I say intimacy, it's not necessarily the first thing that has just popped into your head this morning. It's actually a totally different definition. And we'll get to that a bit later. But this morning, I want to look at these three uh, definitions or translations of the Greek word koinonia and how it affects our relationship, our partnership, our fellowship, our intimate moments with the Holy Spirit. The first one, fellowship. Its definition is to be to have a friendly association, especially with people who shares one's interests. Another way to put it is companionship or sharing together. Of course, our fellowship today has to be with the Holy Spirit. Jesus has ascended into heaven. He now sits at the right hand of God. We see that in the account of Stephen, the first Christian martyr in the book of Acts chapter 7, where he's about to be stoned to death for his beliefs. He, he says, full of the Holy Spirit, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. So Jesus no longer walks and talks on this earth, but rather he is seated at the right hand of God. So of course our fellowship on a day-to-day basis is to be with the Holy Spirit. To experience God in our lives, we actually need the Holy Spirit because there's a separation that exists between God and humanity. And that is bridged by Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is as much as a, a gateway to God as Jesus is. Fellowship with the Holy Spirit is what drove early Christians, early Jesus followers. It's what motivated them. It's what they were sustained by. And I wonder this morning, do we allow the Holy Spirit to sustain us today? Do we allow the Holy Spirit to motivate us today? Do we allow the Holy Spirit as a person to be our driving force today? Acts chapter 20, verse 22 to 24, this is Paul. He's talking about an urgency that he must go to Jerusalem. He feels compelled. He says he's completely in dark about what will happen when he, he gets there, he says, I don't know, I do know that it won't be a picnic for the Holy Spirit has let me know repeatedly and clearly that there are hard times and imprisonment ahead. I love this, but that matters little. What matters most to me is to finish what God started, the job the Master Jesus gave me of letting everyone I meet know all about this incredibly extravagant generosity of God. I think Paul's friendship with the Holy Spirit is a model that we can live by today. Paul is totally comfortable in being led by the Holy Spirit. He trusts the Holy Spirit. He hears the Holy Spirit and he listens. He responds to his friend. And like Paul, we have the exact same opportunity to trust the Holy Spirit in the midst of uncertainty. We can remain determined to stay the path like Paul was, even though he knew that hardship was ahead, but he was determined to stay the path and see out what God has called him to do. The Holy Spirit is a friend that we can rely on, a friend that we can trust, and a friend that we can follow through the moments and the seasons of life. Followers of Christ in the early church were so accustomed to the voice of the Holy Spirit that they could distinguish it in the midst of the noise of life. Last night, my wife Sarah and I had dinner with Tom and Annette DeLuga and Ann Stratton. We had an amazing time. We talked about after last week when I threw Sarah under the bus around cleaning pots and pans. We talked about um, new married things again because it was a great topic to bring up after being burnt last week. Um, and we talked about new marriage and how everyone has these teething issues and Tom would tie his clothes on the clothesline as opposed to putting pegs on. And, uh, you know, people are, people are unique. How people do things is unique. Anyway, I was talking to Tom, and Tom's been in the life of this church since the year 2000 when he was first saved, and he's a great man, and my first memory of Tom is in about 2002, 2003, when we had different campus sites across Toowoomba. I was in the red campus with Pastor Dean and Pastor Nerida Wallace. It was the best campus. Anyway, that's old news. It's not relevant today, but Tom was a, a kids' church worker, a volunteer in our kids' church, and that was my first memory of Tom in this church, and so 16, 17 years later from that first moment, I know Tom really well. Like in a, in a room this size, Tom could 
could yell out some encouragement and I would know it was Tom. Or in the, the midst of a storm, Tom could yell out, Robbo, watch out, and I would know it's Tom because I know him so well. Imagine knowing the Holy Spirit so well, like the early believers of the church of Jesus, that you could distinguish the voice of the Holy Spirit, that in the noise of life, that His voice, Holy Spirit, would come through. In Acts chapter 8, verse 26, verse 29, we see this. As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, go, down, go south down the desert roads that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candake. I don't know how you pronounce that either. The queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship and he was now returning. Seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk along beside the carriage. Philip recounting to Dr. Luke is confident on who has spoken to him. He can distinguish the voice of an angel from the voice of the Holy Spirit. What was common to early believers has been lost over time. And really, we've allowed one of the greatest friendships that we'll ever experience slip away because we haven't been listening. You can't have a friendship if you're not listening. I can't know Tom DeLuga well if I'm not listening to him. I can't know Tavita if I'm not listening to him. I can't know so many amazing people if I don't listen. The original desire of God, Jesus, is that we may know the Holy Spirit so clearly that we could pick his voice, that we could distinguish his voice, whether that's between a voice of an angel, the voice of Tom DeLuga, who has the voice of an angel, <laughs> or something else in our life. That we would do life together. That by being in fellowship, by having an association with the Holy Spirit, that we would begin to grow familiar. That we would begin to be able to distinguish his voice to to hear his discernment, to heed his instructions. The second translation of, of koinonia, partnership, the definition of partnership is, partnership is the state of being a partner or partners. And partners, they, they develop a flow. When you know someone so well, you, you have the, a flow going on. It's like James and I. We know each other so well. We know what works, what doesn't work. We know how to flow with one another. Our favorite sports combined, basketball. We could talk basketball forever. Our favorite game to play on a console, on a TV, basketball, shock horror. And we have spent many days wasted away playing basketball. We don't regret it. And we just keep playing and playing and playing. You know, sometimes you can have shorter matches. I don't know if many people know much about console games, but you can condense the amount of time. So instead of playing an hour and a half, you can play 15 minutes. Well, we play the full hour and a half game. We're there for the, the real deal. And we've developed a flow over the years. We know, I know how James is gonna score. I know what he's gonna try and do. James knows that I'm always gonna try and steal the ball off him. And, and whenever we have friends over, James and I make sure that we're on the same team because we have a flow. We know what's gonna work. We know, we know how we're gonna win. We know how we're gonna beat people. There is a flow that exists when you're in partnership with someone. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse Six to nine, again, the Apostle Paul, he says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. The partnership gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth, the partnership that gives the growth, growth the flow that exists in the partnership. For we are all God's fellow workers. You are God's field, you are God's building. There is a, a partnership that exists between us as believers and God, that we are required to do individual functions to develop the flow, to develop the message, to develop the conversation that God desires for all of us to have. That we would not strive in our own calling, but we would know that being in partnership, we would we would allow God to bring the growth, that he would sustain us, that we wouldn't look to sustain ourselves. And the desire of partnership, the desire of conversation in partnership is something that has existed since creation. 
You just have to look at Adam and Eve in the garden and the conversations that God had with them. You look at the conversations that God had with Abraham, the conversations that God had with Moses, the conversations that that God had with the, the prophets. And sometimes it was location specific. I mean, Moses talked to God as a burning bush in a specific location. And then later in the wilderness, God is speaking in specific locations again to Moses as the Israelites have fled Egypt. But you see, the limitations of only hearing from God in specific places no longer exist when we have a partnership with the Holy Spirit. When we do life together, we, we can converse with God through the Holy Spirit at all times. Jesus himself knew it wasn't practical for him to be available to the whole world at any given time. In John chapter 14, 15, and 16, he, he articulates this to his disciples. In John 14, 26, he says, But the help of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring your remembrance, bring to you remembrance of all that I've had said to you. Another name for the Holy Spirit is the helper. And Jesus is acknowledging that it's impossible for him to teach people everything in his three years of ministry. He knows that his tenure on earth is limited and he'll soon be at the right hand of God. And the Holy Spirit is sent to us to be our counsel on earth, that he teaches us all things, that he reminds us of the works and of the posture of Jesus. In John 15, again, the words of Jesus to his disciples, but when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will, we- he will bear witness about me, and you will also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Being in partnership with the Holy Spirit, we begin to know the, the nature and the characteristics of Jesus. We know the nature and the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. We don't necessarily have to hear his voice to know what he stands for. We know Jesus and his heart for humanity better through a friendship, through a partnership with the Holy Spirit. And we could never understand the complexities of this world and God's heart for humanity without the Holy Spirit. There's just too much information for us to to try and attain without the partnership of the Holy Spirit. John 16, nevertheless, I tell you, it is to your advantage, this is Jesus, to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Again, the helper is the Holy Spirit. And when you think about it, if Jesus was to remain on earth today, he, let's, let's assume for a moment that he didn't ascend to heaven and that he's on earth today and we can converse with him. And he's living in Israel, the Holy Land, and he's now a modern day worker. He's not slaving away, going from place to place in all hours of the night, but he's a modern day worker working 7.25 hours or 8.25 hours a day. And you're a good Christian and you wanna go and converse with the Son of God. So you travel to Israel, you wait at the foot of Jesus or the line to be in the foot of Jesus. It would be three to five years before you have a conversation. Like assuming hundreds of millions of believers wanna go see the Son of God, which I think is a fair assumption, that if we wanna converse with Jesus, the only way we could potentially do that is by traveling to Israel. It would take three to five years waiting in line as someone goes ahead of you to ask the question. And and I could just imagine in maybe the 60 seconds that you get to converse with Jesus because he's got other people to see and he's working 7.25 hours a day, that you would wanna have the best question lined up. And now let's assume you're overawed, which I think is another fair assumption when you meet the Son of God who was resurrected and now is home in Israel. You're overawed for the first 30 seconds. You've probably got 30 seconds to ask a question. And you wanna have a good question. I would always think dinosaurs, that's a good question. People tell you dinosaurs are millions of years old and then you've got people saying the earth is only thousands of years old. Someone ain't telling the truth. But anyway, (laughs) Jesus is saying that it is, it is best for him to go away so that we would experience the relationship with the Holy Spirit, that we would be reminded of the works of Jesus, of the posture of Jesus through the Holy Spirit. It is possible to better know Jesus through the Holy Spirit. 
it is possible to have more frequent conversations with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 15, verse 28, again, the early believers had such an amazing relationship with the Holy Spirit. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on no greater burden than these requirements. The the early church was about to send uh, some gentlemen away. Anyway, it seemed good for the Holy Spirit. Now, how amazing is it when you're in partnership that you don't have to hear the voice of someone you're in partnership to represent them? that you know what they stand for because you know them intimately, you know them well, you know the flow that exists. They know that the Holy Spirit wouldn't require a certain level of commitment. The third translation or third uh, thought of communion, koinonia with the Holy Spirit is intimacy. Now the definition of intimacy is close familiarity It's a tongue twister, say that 10 times, familiarity or friendship, close familiarity or friendship. You see, intimacy with the Holy Spirit is actually just an avenue to a deeper friendship. And emotions that were instilled in us by God are also in Him. In James chapter four, verse five, it says, or do you suppose it is not to the, it is to no purpose that the scripture says, He yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. He yearns jealously. To yearn is to have an intense feeling or longing for something, typically something that one has been lost or separated from. And I think that's just amazing, this picture of we are in partnership with the Holy Spirit, but God still yearns for us. Though that we may experience loss, we may experience sin and error and wrong, and that separates us from partnership, God is always yearning that we would know Him, that we would know the Holy Spirit. I just think it's incredible that yearn truly reflects the heart of God, that He has a longing that we might enter relationship with Him through the Holy Spirit, that our friendship with the Holy Spirit is beyond shallow that we would know him intimately as he yearns for us. You know, the reality is this. If we seek an intimate relationship with the world, we'll never have a fulfilled relationship with the Holy Spirit. We cannot love the world and assume an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. They're not compatible. It's a friendship and a relationship with the Holy Spirit that doesn't doesn't depend on our past experiences or our past performances. His yearning is not dependent on who we are, what we've done, what we will do. And I love the idea, I love sharing that we are a church where you don't have to believe to belong, that God yearns for you whether you choose to believe or not. There is a yearning in God that His Spirit would come alongside you and you would just encounter Him whether you choose to believe or not. We can't accurately reflect the Holy Spirit without hearing Him if we are not intimate. But we can accurately reflect the Holy Spirit if we are intimate with Him, if we do have that deeper relationship. We can represent Him because we know Him and we're in step with Him. Each year, my work runs a program called the High Performance Leadership Coaching Program. Basically, they've run out of managers and executive people to uh, participate in this program, so they're down to people like me who don't hold a significant position. And I'm enjoying the program, and it teaches a lot around how to, to perform at a high level without encountering stress and how to deal with stress in your life. But one of the key components of this program is learning how to meditate. Now, I've done meditation before in in helping to deal with my stress and anxiety, and I use an app called Headspace, and all you do is you're focusing on breathing. There's nothing ooky, spooky, ungodly about it. So I've gone to this meditation at the start of the week this week with an open mind, just hoping that it isn't an ooky, spooky meditation where I'm saying some mantra and whatever. Anyway, I get to the uh, venue where they're having this meditation, and I said to the the course convener, I said, look, I'm a Christian, these are my beliefs, 
I'm slightly skeptical. I'd love for you to explain to me what is about to happen. And she begins the process of, well, Rob, this meditation technique was uh, formed 5,000 years ago by these grand masters in, in South America. And what we do at the start of every meditation is bring flowers and fruit to these masters to say thank you for the meditation that you're about to do. And I had alarm bells going off inside of me going, hang on a minute, this is essentially an offering to a God that has developed this meditation technique. And there is a level of discernment that exists with the Holy Spirit when you're in partnership with Him, when you are intimate with the Holy Spirit, you just know. You know that there are things in this world that are not good for you to experience. You know there are things in this world that are not godly for you to participate in. Anyway, I didn't do that meditation and it was great. The rest of my week at work was not so back-to-back with events. But anyway, there are things that exist that will try and destroy, try and separate that partnership, that intimacy, that fellowship that exists with God and His Spirit. So it's all well and good to know about the Holy Spirit, but how do we participate? How do we become a better friend of the Holy Spirit? Well, I've got three thoughts this morning that I really want to encourage you to, to give a give a try to this week as you go out seeking the Holy Spirit. The first thought is this, a friend makes time. If we wanna have a friendship with the Holy Spirit, we have to be deliberate in making time. A friendship, the kind that God truly desires for us to have, actually comes in time. Are we creating opportunities for the Holy Spirit in our world? Moments free from distraction. Our most intimate friendships happen because we invest time and listen. It's the same with my friendship with James. It's the same with my friendship with Tom and Annette and Ann Stratt. It's something that has developed over time. And maybe it's a case when we choose to make time for the Holy Spirit that we sacrifice our favorite TV show. Maybe it's a case of not reading a specific novel before going to bed, but rather consuming the Word of God and just praying to the Holy Spirit. Unhealthy relationships are demanding, but that's not the relationship that God has intended for us to have with the Holy Spirit. God's desire is that we would experience the better together life when we choose the godly thing over the good thing, that we would pause and allow the partnership to grow. Second thought is this, a friend defends. A friendship, be it with your best friend or be it with the Holy Spirit, requires you to defend and to protect, to speak well of, to encourage, to participate in life with. Do we defend the Holy Spirit? Are we prepared to defend the Holy Spirit at the same level as someone that's sitting next to us? Are we prepared to defend the Holy Spirit in a conversation with our work colleagues as much as we are when they bring up the topic of Jesus. Mark chapter three, verse 28 to 30. I think this is one of the the strongest uh, conversations, one of the strongest messages that God conveys to early Christians, to believers. Truly, I say to you, all your sins will be forgiven, the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness. Jesus passionately defends the Holy Spirit with some pretty strong words. Like that's a pretty strong conversation that Jesus is having in in the moment. And there are many discussions in the theological scholar world around what this means. And some scholars suggest it's because the Holy Spirit has feminine qualities. And you see how the, the way wisdom, Holy Spirit's wisdom is referred to in Proverbs. It's always referred to in the feminine, but that's another story for a different day. Ask Shane Willard when he's here next what it's all about. But what I fully understand is this. If I cannot defend the person of the Holy Spirit, I am not a friend. If I'm not prepared to draw a line in the sand to, to state my claim of the Holy Spirit as a person and I'm prepared to defend them as much as I am everyone else, I'm not a true friend that the better together friendship will never work if we're not prepared to defend it. My third thought is this, a friend loves. 
And if I'm honest, this is something I, I totally struggle with. And I think it, it's a realistic struggle that a lot of us will have. Because it doesn't seem logical to love something that isn't necessarily present physically. But part of the struggle for me in loving the Holy Spirit is this transition of, a, of the Holy Spirit as a dove to a Holy Spirit as a person. You know, growing up, New Hope Church wasn't home for about the first five years of my life. We were participating in another church before it uh, ceased to exist. And their interpretation and how they presented the Holy Spirit is totally different to how we do it at New Hope Church. And they say the first five years of a child's life is when they're most impressionable, when they're most likely to learn different things. And how the Holy Spirit was presented back then, it's like, oh my goodness, that, that's a bit weird. I don't, how can I love something that is that weird? And I think in the transition of thought from the Holy Spirit as a dove to the Holy Spirit as a person, we can begin to, to love the Holy Spirit as we love Jesus. We can begin to love the nature and the qualities of the Holy Spirit as we do Jesus. Is that cool? This morning I wanna encourage us that the Holy Spirit is a friend, someone who we can trust, someone who we can rely on, someone we can have fellowship with, someone that we can have partnership with, someone that we can be intimate with. And this morning I just feel that Jesus wanted to remind some people that this mindset of the Holy Spirit being this this weird mystical dove is not true. It's not really who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is a person and He desires to be a friend. He yearns for friendship regardless of what your week has looked like. He yearns for friendship regardless of what you're going through. And ultimately, His yearning is not dependent on our past. He sees you and He loves you. Why don't we stand together? Now, this morning, I, I really hope that uh, this message has encouraged you that the Holy Spirit isn't this non-attainable personhood of, of God, that He is actually a relatable person, that He is someone that desires relationship with you. And I think that the, the greatest part of, of this is the relationship with the Holy Spirit is not unique to what God desires for each and every one of us. God desires that we are all in relationship with Him. God desires for us all to experience the fullness of life, the, the freedom that comes when we choose to follow Him. And it's, it's something we can struggle with. We can, we can think that we don't deserve the relationship that God wants us to have. We can think that we don't deserve the, the peace and the mercy and the freedom that is found in, in Jesus. And I think that's what makes the gospel, the good news of Jesus so amazing, that we don't get what we deserve, but rather we get to experience the, the infinite love, the infinite grace, the infinite wisdom, the infinite provision, the timeless provision of God again and again and again. When we close our eyes and bow our heads for a moment of, of privacy, this morning, if you've never had a relationship with Jesus, you've never entered a partnership, you've never entered fellowship with Jesus, you've never made a decision to, to lay aside the sin and the error and the wrong in your life and choose to follow Jesus, I wanna allow you the opportunity to respond to His desire to be in relationship with you. And while no one's looking around, just ask that you extend your hand and I'd love to pray for you this morning. If that's you, if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, if you've never made a decision to be in partnership with Him, why don't you stick your hand up while no one's looking around. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe you're here this morning and you have been in partnership with God before, you have been in partnership with Jesus before, but you just know that the decisions you've made, the life that you currently live ha has created a gap in that relationship and you know that it's not functioning how it used to, that, that reliance on God isn't there, that there is a, a gap that exists, a break that exists in your relationship with God and you'd like to 
just return to God. You just like to have that relationship restored again while no one's looking around, every eye's closed. I'd love to pray for you if you'd like to put up your hand. I'd acknowledge it and you can put it straight back down. No one's looking. Thank you, Jesus. Well, God, we thank you this morning that you have spoken to us. Holy Spirit, we pray that this week we would begin the process of better knowing you, that we would begin the process of entering a true friendship with you, a a partnership, God, a fellowship, that we would experience moments of intimacy. God, I just pray that we would so intrinsically know you that we could distinguish the voice of an angel and and the Holy Spirit, that we would know you so well, God, that we would hear your voice in the midst of the noise of life. We thank you for the the wonderful people that call New Hope Church home, God, and the blessing and the provision that will follow them this week. In your mighty name, Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for listening this morning. We're going to pray like we do every week, and whether you put your hand up or not, I believe if, if this is a confession of your heart, that Jesus sees it all the same. So let's pray together. Dear Jesus, I believe in you. Thank you for forgiving me. Come into my life and I'll follow you. Amen, amen. You guys are awesome. Make sure you come to the six o'clock service tonight because Sarah Trosden is gonna preach. And she told me before pre-service what she's gonna preach on and it's gonna be amazing. So don't miss out. Thanks, Sarah.